Hello, and thank you for tuning in to my discussion with John Verveke and myself, where we discuss something that John really developed, and we've been fine-tuning it through the course that I'll tell you about in a moment that we're going to be doing in February. But the practice is, a, I think we're calling it the Neoplatonic Contemplative Exercise, or meditation, if you will. And it's a progressive, you could think about it, and we'll, you know, we'll go into depth of describing what it is and how to practice it and what each of the stages are, the progressive stages are. But essentially, you can think about them as the Neoplatonic sense of the way being itself is intelligible. And in the classical sense of the way of knowing and learning, was with if we just take the world as having intelligibility, then learning about reality, we will become more fitted to reality. We can become more conformed with reality, which is an experiential, full body, mind, neurological, spiritual process. So you could say that this this contemplative exercise that we're going to be describing in our conversation goes deep into the specific levels of understanding of how one becomes more fitted with, at one with reality as such in a platonic sense of the word. And this also, as I mentioned, is one of the exercises um, that we go deep into at the, the Dialogo Circling Weekend. This is our second time putting putting this on, and it's it's taught by John Verveke, my friend Chris, and, and myself. Um, and it's our second time putting it on. The first one exceeded our expectations. It was so awesome. And so we are fine-tuning it, and we're going to put another one on February 19th and 20th. It's February 19th and 20th. 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on both days. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. There's a discount if you sign up before February 6th. I think it's like a $50 discount. The link to register is in the show notes below. And that's, um, uh, or you can just go to the Circling Institute slash Circling slash Dialogos and sign up there. All right. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and this will be the first of many. Be cool. All right. Welcome, John. It's good to see you again. Hey, guy. It's great to see you again. <laughs> great to see you again. Excellent. I'm excited about this. It may take a couple of videos to, to, to get complete sure. on this yep. so we can take our time. Um, however, there's something that I, I first heard um, you speak about explicitly, and I think, I think you call it um, uh, something called platonic levels of contemplation. Yeah, neoplatonic, yeah. yes. Yeah, the yeah. neoplatonic levels of contemplation. And it's, um, so I wanted to talk about, and in, in, in you presented it in our course that we did together, yes. um, the yeah. Dialogue into Dialogos course um, and Circling course. The as a, you could say, a something distinct from Eastern, what most people consider mindfulness and Eastern meditation. Yep, very right? much. Yep. Similarities to it, right? And places that they, they touch together. However, it's a, a, a very unique, a unique place that you come from around it. Mm -hmm. and, um, is, mm -hmm. is really, is really goes deep in our own Western history. And so I thought it'd be really great um, to go over each of the distinctions of the levels, right? And talk about what yes. is contemplation, right? And then talk about your own personal experience because this is, I know this is something that you have been um, researching and developing both theoretically and, right? And uh, practically, yeah. right? You've been practically yeah. and yeah. working on that, right? And you, you said that you've had some updates yeah. since the last time we talked about it. So I wanna hear about all that too, as well. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to sort of uh, like reverse engineer or or, or uh, uh, do archaeological engineering of what these practices may have looked like uh, within the Neoplatonic community. 
uh, making use of some stuff that we have published material on, like the view from above, and some of the things about uh, the, uh, some other uh, uh, ascesis spiritual exercises that, that were preserved in the Stoic tradition and some of the Neoplatonic traditions, some of the things that are said about dialectic. And then just uh, some of the things I, I, I've concluded from the study I've done in cognitive science. Uh, maybe I should start by just distinguishing meditation from contemplation for people. Yeah. Uh, very, very, yeah. very briefly. Uh, I do entire videos on this. Um, but in meditation, you're learning to step back and look at your framing. And I use the example to become something of a meme. Like normally you're not paying attention to how you're framing the world. You're paying attention through it, mm -hmm. you know, by means of it and beyond it. And in meditation, you learn to step back and look at it yeah. um, to see if there might be stuff that is actually distorting your vision. But you only really know if you've done the correct thing in meditation, if you actually put your glasses back on and see if you can see more properly into the world now. Um, and uh, that's what uh, uh, I've argued with Leo Ferraro. We argued together is best understood by the word contemplation. Uh, contemplatio is a Latin word for the Greek word theoria, which means to look deeply into things, uh, originally even travel to a new place to see something new that you haven't seen before. Uh, the word temple is in contemplatio because you're looking up and into uh, the sky. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. And what you're doing is you want to, and this is influenced by Plato's notion of anagoge, you, these two practices complement each other. Uh, meditation helps to break up inappropriate framing. And that's what you're doing when you're becoming aware of the framing and cleaning the distortions. Contemplation allows you to create new framing, see, see differently. And notice, I can only tell if I've cleared, cleaned my glasses if I can see anew. Mm -hmm. But I, right, I can only see anew if I take my glasses off and uh, clean them. Yeah. And so you, you meditate to break frame, uh, you contemplate to make new frame, and you get the possibility of profound insight uh, into uh, yourself and reality. That's contemplation. You know, it's interesting as you say that I'm, you know, having, having, um, you know, been meditating since my early twenties. Uh, my first, my first experience of that was doing a, like a ten day vipassana retreat. <laughs> so yeah, I just yeah, threw yeah, myself yeah. right in the deep end, and I've pretty much been doing it ever since. And I, just hearing you just now talk about that, I was just realizing that I think for myself and a lot of people that I've worked with in meditation, they end up actually having very implicitly these contemplative realizations about the world, right? Yes. Simultaneous, yes. right? But not, but this puts a distinction in there that I, that I, I don't think is people are generally prone to recognize, right? As such, yeah. this, this is a really cool distinction. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the distinction is an intent to uh, to explicate what is largely implicit, and by explicating it and engaging in more deliberate uh, deliberative practice and deliberate practice, uh, you can uh, enhance that capacity. Um, and so, what we're doing in um, the Neoplatonic version of contemplation is you're basically enacting. Uh, so Neoplatonism is an, is, is an integration of, uh, of Platonism and Aristotelianism. You're basically, um, you, you're basically trying to contemplate in a way that is also affording the anagogic ascent. So the anagogic ascent is the idea that uh, um, what I'm doing is I'm conforming to patterns of reality out there, and, they, and, and that, that reveals and discloses certain aspects of how I'm making sense of the world. And um, when, I, when I get those conforming, then I get my, more, my inner psyche more ordered. And then that scaffolds me to a, a more comprehensive form of cognition that launches me more deeply into a more comprehensive um, uh, level, if you want to put it, of re reality. And so and then the, what you're doing is you're basically conforming uh, different aspects of the psyche to different aspects of the world. And then those conforming, right? Each one is, is developmentally makes the next level of conforming possible and so on. And so that, that leveling up 
and the, the reference to video gaming is intended, the leveling up of conforming is how you get the fundamental transformation um, that you're after uh, within the Neoplatonic um, right. practice. And would you so, say, would you what, say that what, what, what's presupposed in what you're saying too is brings to mind, which seems important to probably kind of distinguish as a ground level, I think is, is the, is the, is the what the classical Western idea of what knowledge is, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Pre, you know, pre Descartes, which is knowledge is seen as something or the world is seen as something that, uh, it's taken for granted is intelligible. And then yeah. contemplation or philosophy asks the question, what, how must the world be such that it's intelligible? Right. And yes. That has to do with this conformity. Knowledge is conformity with deeper dimensions of reality. Right. And, and that means the answer to that question is also not a statement of propositions or not reducible to a statement of pro, a statement of pro, pro, propositions, realizing right, that conformity, realizing that kind of knowledge is a process that is, as I said, much more transformative in nature. Yeah. And you're, you're transforming like the, like these various, like I call them the four ways of knowing, you're trying to transform all of them in a way that is also properly aligning them. Um, so they're mutually supporting and constraining each other. Um, so I would, I, I, I think there's a lot going on uh, but the best thing to do is to sort of go through what, like, sort of what each level is and what it looks like in the practice and what part of the psyche um, is being uh, activated, uh, if I can use that term. Uh, this is deeply influ influenced by Pearl, P E R L, right. reading right. Of, uh, of, of Plotinus. And that what you do, it, it, the, the level, because the fundamental presupposition is intelligibility, and intelligibility is is the conformity of cognition and being together, right? Uh, each one of these levels is simultaneously a, a, a level of being and a level of being known um, yeah. and a kind of a processing in the psyche. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should do that. Maybe sort of talking through it um, be a good way of trying to explicate it further. Yeah, and in, in, pra in practice, I mean, I think you've talked about doing this you walked everyone through it in a, in an imaginative contemplative exercise sitting still, but I've also heard you talk about it doing it. And I've been doing it when I walk. When you walk, you, you can walk around and do it. It's yeah. very good walking, yeah. contemplating practice, contemplation practice. And we have to remember how physical ancient philosophy was. The Stoas are walking up and down the Stoa, right? Yeah. Uh, right. And, and you, the dialogues are often people moving around or in a yeah. very, uh, in a place or walking somewhere. Um, or so um, the basic idea here is um, this notion of intelligibility. That's a very abstract notion for most people. And what you want to do is you want to trade it, trade, you want to translate it into something that's experiential, something that it has a phenomenal, phenomenological structure and content to it. Um, and so the way I do that is uh, try to get people to just concentrate on. Uh, the sense of things being real. And most people uh, know two things about this. They know that this is very important. They have an intuitive sense that this, because they, if they, they start to lose their grip on this, they know that that means insanity. So they know they have, a, 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 it's powerfully uh, uh, present to them in an intuitive fashion, uh, but they also simultaneously uh, can't articulate very much what that is. And so what you're doing in, in the practice is you first get people to get into a, a basic mindfulness state. And what you're trying to do is take them through some of the things that um, get them to realize, and, and I'm going to play with this because I'm doing conformity here, will get them to realize realization. They'll come to awareness of how reality is realizing it. So first of all, don't think of reality as a noun. Think of it as a verb. Thinking, think of, think of it as being um, in, in, in a profound way. Mm -hmm. And so there's exercises you can do. I won't go into the preliminary exercises, but what, what you do first is you're, you're directing your attention to the level of uh, what's called fusis, 
Uh, and phusis means, you know, things springing forth from themselves. And what you're trying to get there is the, the fundamental sense of emergence, of appearance. Now, we normally set appearance at, in opposition uh, to reality, uh, but I would put it to you that, that's, that, that, that there's a bit of a mistake there uh, because all appearances are appearances of and from reality. And I, I, I can't make the argument right now, but I would say to you, and this is based on some of Schindler's work, that beauty is when appearance is disclosing realness. Uh, mm -hmm. That when we have a sense that the appearance is not taking us away from what's behind the appearance, but welcoming us into the depth behind the appearance. And so that you're trying to get that sense of, so the way to think about it is remember when you had a moment of beauty and, and the world just sort of strikes you. And then what you want to realize is you try to realize that that's happening, right? Every moment, every moment is a moment of the world emerging for you. And this is, this is your basic level. This is where your psyche is just, your psyche isn't representing being or thinking. You're, this is just, your psyche is emerging into existence. And the way you can get that is you can just get the sense of every moment. And when you're walking, this is very powerful. You can just like, okay, now, and the, the world is just, the world just keeps emerging. And, and that, is, that is a primordial phenomenological dimension of realness because it's, it's not coming from you. You and the world are co-emerging together. This is a deep kind of conformity. Right. It's that kind of thing when you talk about emergence. So experientially, that would be if I'm walking, if I'm walking around and I'm starting to get present to fusis, right? Yeah. Um, what you're saying by emergence is that is that when I experience it, it's not, I realize it was something that was already happening, implicit in yes. reality. And then my seeing or my comprehending um has this experience of, in some sense, discovering it has already happening, right? So the yes, that's, is, that's is what's already yes. happening. Yes, yeah, and it, and it, and 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 there's a there's a sense of recovering the depths to which the appearances can point. So you're looking at the flower, and it can just be right. But then, if you get that sense of emergence, you get the sense of Right, but there's like that's that's coming from some depth to you. There, like everything is. That's why it, uh, I try to use the word emergence rather than appearing. Everything is emerging, um, you know, out of nothingness. If you want to put it that way, everything is emerging into. And so this is this is the way you are emerging, and I am emerging. There's a part at there, like at the at, at the basement of our being. There is the fact that we are constantly emerging. Think about this, like when you wake up in the morning and you come back to reality as we say and as the world emerges to you <laughs> and you're you're, you're basically uh, practicing the fact that you are you like everything around you everything is co-emerging together you can see that in all of these in all of these levels we're, we're playing with the fundamental tension of the one and the many there are many things but we are all co-emerging together like so the, the desk in front of me is now it's here now and i'm here now and it's striking me as here now and right. And, and, and right and this is boom right this is the fundamental difference from nothingness the somethingness of the world yeah totally and so and this is also this core this first level also has a has a historical correlation too because this is these are thesis is and also logos it lies at the very beginnings of philosophical thinking in the pre-Socratic. Very, very, very much. Right. Uh, so the, the, this, the, the Greeks were, were the first to, as far as we can tell, to pose the question of emergence, which, which is often stated statically, which is a little bit of a misrepresentation, but why is there something rather than nothing? And instead of giving an, a, a narrative causal origin, well, it goes back to the gods. They, no, no, they were more interested in, right? Because the Greeks discovered the distinction between immortality and eternity, yeah. right? And they realized that the gods themselves were contingent and could pass away. So the yeah. gods were not the source of being. And, and so the Greeks are the first to raise that question. And what you're doing is to try to take that. 
like we ultimately, right? Th this is the this is the 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 bullet to the center of the skull, the, the diamond bullet to the center of the skull I got from Spinoza. When I when I read that line and Spinoza said, but God does not have abstract ideas. Yeah. We have these abstract ideas about being, but we conform more to God, ultimate reality, when we when, when we make them intimate to the fabric of our being. And that's what this practice is trying to do. You're trying to take that abstract notion of why is there something rather, and you're trying to realize it. As, and, and, and what you're doing is you're not just representing it, you're instantiating it moment by moment. You are emerging into being. The world is emerging into being. Yes. So, so to make the correlation in, in practice, it'd be something similar to like where Perimides is walking around and he's, he's getting this sense of, he's noticing that, that, oh, there's something more primal than even the gods. And then he yes. starts to look at reality and then it starts to emerge for him this primorality that isn't that that he realizes oh this is what we make stories all about but they're yes in the stories themselves is that analogous to something like in our normal lives it's like we walk around thinking that we're looking at reality but instead i look at my mom and instead i have all the whole the narratives that i pick up about my mother and all the narratives i have about the world and, and you, yeah, and you're trying to reap, if you'll allow me uh, an electronic metaphor, you're trying to plug the appearances, because that's what those are, you're trying to see them as aspects of, of reality, rather than the full face of reality. Um, so it's, it's like, it's like carrying around um, the sense of why doesn't what like, why doesn't it just wink out of existence right now, like to get that sense, right, of that there's something that keeps affording the emergence and that's Fusis. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's something ultimately mysterious about it, but that doesn't mean that it isn't something we can, as I said, come into greater, greater conformity. And so generally uh, it's initially a better thing for people to do this part of the practice. In fact, all of the levels initially walking around because the movement as you're walking around gives you the sense of the fluency of being, how it's constantly emerging into your awareness. Mm. Um, maybe I, I should go on then because I, I, I could talk for each one of these levels a lot. Yeah. And then you move, and then you move to suke. Mm -hmm. uh, and so suke means, you know, uh, breath, but it also means life and it, it points to all the ways in which reality is self-organizing. Mm -hmm. So a one, so think about you when notice we use the metaphor of being in touch with reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the first thing, the first is the moment of emergence, the moment of contact. Now that something has emerged. The next is continuity of contact. Mm -hmm. And that's what suke is that the universe isn't just blip. Blip, blip. one moment is continuous feeds into gives birth to the next and so you're what you're starting to do and this is what i'm you know i'm trying to also in another area do with eidetic adduction and you and daniel have been having some great talks about that yeah. you're trying to you're seeing that there's a through line right that, that the past doesn't the past is right into the present and reaching to the future there's there's a through line of existence um and so what Fusis did, is picking up on is it's picking up on that level of your psyche that is finding patterns. Patterns are your ways of disclosing continuity because what a pattern is, is repetition with change. And it's a way of finding, realizing, right? Continuity. So I open my eyes and there's that initial emergence into consciousness, which is analogous and can conform to the emergence of being. And then I immediately start forming patterns. Yes. Okay. So it's fusis, the recognition of emergence, yeah. and fusis, right, which is the initial glimpse where it looks out at yeah. you, it, right? Yeah. And, and so fusis is there's just there there's there's something. It, it's just the thereness of the world. It's there, right? right? The thereness, here nowness, and then and and the suke starts to get it starts to give you patterns, which is you know you start to get this and that. Well, this sidewalk, this tree, right? The leaves. And you're noticing that 
patterns are forming. And notice that there, it's interesting about patterns and Rusin's notion of the musicality of intelligibility picks yeah. up on this. Like, where's the where is the pattern? Is it inside you or outside you? Well, if you're if you if you open, you see that it's both, right? That you, your mind can only pattern itself because reality is patterned, but the patterning of reality is being realized, right, and, and brought into your awareness by the patterning of your psyche. So this is your basic intelligence. This is that part of us that unlike plants, well, plants do it a little bit, but unlike stones, that, for example, we, we are picking up on a continuity that uh, the, the world is patterned for us. Okay, got it. So it'd be something like, so the, there's the emergence, right? Do you just start, start to get this sense of everything is coming into being, right? Yep. Including the awareness that's recognized, it has this emergent. Exactly, pattern. exactly, exactly. And then psyche is where you start to notice the, the path that it actually emerges in and through and as patterns, right? You start to see the relationship between things up, down. There's myself as distinct from what it's, it's seeing, yeah. but, the, but they're both emerging and you see that connection. You start. Yeah. And, and, to come forward. And, and so you, you also get a heightening of the one in the mini because the patterns are, are, are going down to the smallest determinacy of this thing. And they're there. And they're also weaving together to the, you know, the, the overall pattern of everything. Right. And so you, you're getting this, overall patterning that's happening and and this is this is again this is like the level of of life intelligence the ability to track patterns is the fundamental feature of life and then also of mind totally and when you're really tracking the patterns and this is how you know maybe to is a it can be a diagnostic i'll check it out with you is that you know that you're starting to track the pattern as suke right from a place of suke when, when the realization of suke affords a deeper realization of fusis, right? So it's got- Very this, much, right? yeah, very much. So you get, think you get from the like, sense. That's the thing from something like, oh, an associative response to, you know, that is John over there and John's like this. And it, it doesn't ha help you disclose John more, right? But when you see, oh, John is a human being, Oh, and John's is a man. Wait, I'm a man, and I'm seeing John. And then you start to see John as an emergence, a pattern that simultaneously emerges, and that pattern affords you to to get closer with John in that emergence. Yeah, that's exactly okay. right, God. Okay. So the 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 lower levels always empower the level above, and the level above structures and discloses more. It actualizes the power of the lower level, uh, and this is the Aristotelian sort of motif within the practice okay, so once you get the sense uh, uh of of uh, of suke then you move to noesis and so again so think you know first of all there's contact right and then there's patterns my fingers start to find patterns right and then there's noesis there's coherence the patterns are, are not like random threads they cohere, they interpenetrate, they mutually afford and constrain each other. Uh, everything individually and collectively is realizing the one. Um, and so what you're, what you're getting here is what happens at the level of your consciousness. Your consciousness, your intelligence can just, you know, here's a pattern, here's a pattern, here's a pattern. Here's, your consciousness is yes, but how do all the patterns fit together in a world? And so you, you, you have an inner world that gives you the ability to track the worlding of the exterior world, but you're just both part of the process of worlding, of everything cohering and making sense. And notice how this is how you, you know, how you distinguish the dream um, from the from the from the real world, because the dream is incoherent; it doesn't fit in. And you have these patterns of coherence that are um, are, are are disclosing themselves to you very very powerfully. And, and so what you're getting here, um, and this, it, like, eventually I want to integrate these two together. This takes you into a deeper level of eidetic adduction because now you're, the eidetic adduction is just, everything is, right, expanding out and interpenetrating everything else. And so the idea here is you're moving towards kind of a, a holographic holism where 
everything is, every pattern is not just coherent, um, like in a static sense, but it, this pattern here is all the other patterns converging into it. And yet it can, it is part of all the patterns that converge into everything. So you, you, you can even do this conceptually like, okay, so there's a tree and there's a leaves, but I need to know about green and there's wood and the woods is the soil and the light and the sun and the earth and uh, things revolving and gravity and right. And it's all there in the tree right? implicitly. Right now, it's all there also in, 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 in the sidewalk, but differently implicit. And you're seeing this holographic holism. This, so things are coherent, but they're coherent in depth. Um, and, and this, so this is, is right. So fusis, I mean? it goes fusis, psyche, noesis. Right? That's right. Noesis, right. Mm -hmm. So now you're at the, the sort of like I said, the sort of kind of holographic holism, you're, you're picking up on the sort of the depth of the dimensionality of your intelligibility, right? And you're getting a sense of how all these patterns weave together. Um, and, and, and the weaving of the world and the weaving of your consciousness are interpenetrating and co-identifying and co-conforming in, in a powerful way. Now, what, what you do, what you then do is, right, you're, you're moving to realize that this, these, this, the, the, the principles of this patterning are, are not, how do I, how, how do I put it? They're not locatable in space and time, because what you're doing here is, right, you're, you're weaving everything into this world of intelligibility, but but the the principles of self organization and coherence are not themselves further patterns. They are the way uh, they are the patterning. Yeah. And so you start to move to a sense of. And and this is really this is the tricky part in noesis. You try to realize how all of these different patterns of intelligibility are not just here and now. There's an eternal aspect to them, and they are also uh, they're that they're also being made one in an, in an eternal way. And, and you think, what do you mean, John? Well, because I know that the same patterns that, that have made this tree possible have made trees going back to the beginning of trees possible and will make trees possible. And those constraints, uh, right, and those patterns that are available in reality and also conceivable in my mind, right, they're still there. So I get the sense of this world or, or, or better, as I sometimes put it, the oneness of this, right, is not in bound to any particular place or time. It's in all places and time, but it's not bound to any place or time. So is it, is it fair to say noesis is that, that, that intuition and experience of the intuition of the through line that connects this tree to all the other trees that connects yeah. this tree to the idea that I'm currently having about this tree to all other yeah. trees, that through line that connects. Yes. That, that realization of that through line is noesis. Yes. Okay. Yes. All of them. Uh, yeah. Because of course the tree is also the living thing is also the place, right. That has a particular niche within an ecology. It's all kind like, and this is, this is part of the eidetic adduction realizing Right, that you're mostly ignorant of anything you're seeing, yeah. um, and that, and what you're doing is trying to get this kind of learned ignorance. You're trying to open yourself up to the realization that there's so much more, but not in a random chaotic so much more. There's so much more in a way that continually right surprises you by its capacity for intelligibility. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. So that's no easiness. Yes. And so, and then what you want to do is you start to want to move towards henosis. And this is a, this involves kenosis and emptying process. And what you want to do, and this is like how it's like the view from above is you want to go from realizing that all of this is not dependent on your thinking and living and being, but the other way around your thinking and living and being is dependent on it or better thou. Right. And yeah. so you go from being egocentric to ontocentric centered on realness and you're really trying to get the sense that uh, of how every moment 
physical realization, biological realization, perceptual cognitive realization that you're having are dependent on these more primordial principles of being, right? Of phusis and of suke and of noesis. And now you're starting to move into henosis. Okay, got it. And so henosis, right, is, so kinosis is where you start to recognize the through line through everything that's affording everything else, right? And then hen- that, that's that's noesis, yeah. noesis or noesis. So as I start to yeah. see noesis and that develops and that gets going, then kenosis starts to happen, and that's right. But there's a transition thing, like I said, of kenosis, the emptying, because the Uh-oh. temptation when you're doing this is to get you can get into sort of an egocentric inflation, right? And right, oh right, and, and look at how wonderful I am. And it's the other way around. You want to, right? You want to empty. Uh, this yeah. is the, 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 right? This is sort of a, a drawn from Christian Platonism, uh, the self-emptying of Jesus, right? And, and the idea here is that what you're trying to do is to make clear to yourself, not as a thought, but as something that even may shiver you in your being of how you participate in processes that precede you and exceed you in um, incomprehensible ways. And that is not a a narrative about a past event. That is an ongoing principle of your present existence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then you're going to move to henosis. First of all, what you're going to do is you're going to try and just focus on that non-spatial non-temporal oneness however because the holographic right right the holographic sense you got right uh, uh, uh the holographic wholeness right there's a oneness to that and it's not the oneness of a being it's the oneness that makes possible everything else that's come right come with that it's the oneness that you first got a taste of in Fusus, and then you got more of a taste of in Suke, and then more of a taste of in Noesis, and then you're opening up. It's okay. It's beyond all the things. It's it's emergence and co- continuity and coherence, and then even more. It's not bound to any particular t- place or time. All the places and times, all the thoughts I have are bound to it. Mm-hmm. The other way around, mm-hmm. and then you realize, and then you do this move. Just as all of my thinking, living and moving and being is dependent on the fusis and the suke and the noesis and, and, and the oneness, all of this, right, is just a symbol, right, for the following. Everything, I've, all the oneness I've experienced so far is oneness by participation. It's participating in this principle of oneness. But there's a oneness that is not a oneness of participation, but it's just a oneness, not by participation. It does it, things aren't right. It's not expressing it. It's just a pure principle, and it's like, and it, of course, it's incomprehensible, right? And the the idea is, it's what you're trying to do then is realize that there's even behind that sort of sense of the oneness of you and the world and everything, all of that is just a symbol a participatory symbol of what is one in itself, not right. That is the source of realization, both cognitively and, and, and ontologically itself. And you can't realize this. And so you say, well, what do you always do, John? Well, you do, you do this trajectory. You get every time you try and push it a little bit farther, you realize, and this is like the meditative questioning act. You uh, like, Oh, right. This is the principle of oneness behind all things. But that, for, now you have a thing in your mind. And you yeah. say, Thank you. But that is just a symbol of what's beyond that. And yeah. then you get, you, get a, you get some other inkling and you go, and then what you start to realize and you do it both outwardly and inwardly, right? But wherever your mind tries to land and say, aha, now I have it. You go, thank you. That's an even better symbol that I can look through. And I, and I get the sense of the opening Right, that I can, and then that, and then what I get is that I get the learned ignorance. I get the the moment of unending wonder. Right. 
Right. Totally. And this is, and this recognition that can't ever be fully recognized, but only recognized in that it's not that which is from participation. That level is, what do we call that? Uh, well, that's henosis. And yeah. if you get that sense yeah. of the sacredness of that, that's theosis. Theosis. Okay. Right. Theosis. Yes. And that's, and theosis is something like the impulse that's happening in negative theology, right? Yeah, very that, much. That, it's that recognition. It, it, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, very much. And it, 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 it's the notion. So the, 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 the West, Catholic and Protestant have a notion of salvation. Um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is um, very deeply indebted to negative theology, um, has a notion of theosis, uh, which is a notion of, um, well, it, it's becoming godlike. Um, and it goes back to Plato. Plato talks a lot about this in the Republic and other uh, dialogues. It's this idea of, and Spinoza talks about it too, when he talks about there's some, when there's in the deepest kind of scientia intuitiva, the third kind of knowing, and we're doing something like that, by the way, with, in, the, yeah. in this practice, right? Um, you're getting to a place where you're recognizing the eternity of your mind and body, both for Spinoza, by the way, never just one, uh, that is indistinguishable from the eternity of God. Um, and and it, it's a it, so it's it's an identification. Now, before people's eyebrows go up, remember that you have to pass through kenosis thoroughly and deeply before the identification of theosis is possible. This is not anything. This is not you consuming anything into your ego and thereby identifying it. This is you ecstasis. This is you being carried beyond. You have a continually a continual trajectory of transformation that is like an arrow pointing beyond, like, like yeah. it's, it's this active arrow pointing you towards something that you are continually conforming to. And so it's, it's not anything being taken into you in egocentric identification. It's always you being taken beyond every time you try to circle the ego around it. You, and you don't treat this with hostility because this is itself the very process of intelligibility and realization. You thank it and say, ah, but what was behind you? What made you possible? Yes, yes. And that in this, and when it's really going, that recognition of, I keep getting this image of, and it's like a body memory of all the experiences that I've had like this. And I've heard a lot of people talk about where, yeah, you're start, you start to have this realization as things shine through and you're like, oh, this is, this is it. I'm seeing it. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, there's an it. Yeah. And then in that realization is it simultaneously that there, what I was seeing is actually what's doing the seeing. And then you start to see that, right? And then <laughs> yes. that become an it. And then you're like, wait a minute, that's an it. And it gets closer and closer and closer. This kind of subject object realization uh, it, you, you, on itself, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I find that the more I do this part of the practice, the more those there's a reverberation back. It's like, oh, you know, there was this, there was the eye that was make that, that was not seeing, sorry, that was not seen, yeah. but was affording the seeing of whatever me was confronting the reality. But there's also something that corresponds to the mystery of the eye, right? Yeah. Whatever, whatever also, whatever intelligibility was shaped from the world side, there's something behind that too, right? right. And so the agent and the arena are both going like asymptoting towards the horizon um, yeah. in this sort of resonant manner. And that's the anagoge. That's where you're in the deepest, deepest possible conformity. This is not anything you can have as a thought. This is the deepest kind of conformity. It's the, it's the kind of knowing that is indistinguishable from being. Right. You're no, right. The, the, right. This is the, you're, 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 you're at the place where you're not representing, you're enacting, you're being, yeah. being. I mean, that sounds like a redundant statement, but that's the point. Right. Um, and so this, this is supposed to give you a sense of, right, that part of you, so in the Christian tradition, that is the image of God, that part of you, which is not an idol, 
that that part of you that is capable of um, this this profound uh, conformity towards God. I'm not just going to say conformity with, because that gives you a sense of completion, but this ongoing conformity towards, yeah. um, and, and that, that discloses something about God or ultimate reality. If you don't like God as a term, but that discloses something about ultimate reality that you can only be, that you can never have as a thought or an idea or a representation. And then you may say, well, what's the use of that? My ideas are what empower me. No, ultimately this, to get to this place, to get what Tillich would call the ground of being, the God beyond the God of theism, is the place in which the most, this is, this is the space from which the greatest aletheia of the psyche and the world is possible. The greatest opening, the greatest disclosures, the greatest insight, that this, this conformity is, is to give you the touchstone taste of what realness is like. So you try to, you're like, when you're into, when you're in this final state, you're, tr you're trying to be as still as you can inward and as open as you can outward. So what you're doing is you're indwelling as much outward and you're internalizing as much inward. This is this, this state of still openness, but it's not a static still openness. It's a stilling opening. Um, yeah. Stilling opening, yes, right. Right, and so and and that place, right? That for, for that is where you are trying to remember sati in the deep sense of remembering. You're trying to remember the touchstone taste of realness. Mm -hmm. and you're trying to make it second nature that this, this is part of scanty intuitiva. So it's it's like it's prokyron. It's ready to hand this touchstone taste of realness. So when you're in the middle of your bullshit. You've got to, you don't just have to rely on an idea or you've got this taste like woven and you go, wait, this just doesn't taste real. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. That, that <laughs> is. So it's this it's like where you start to have a visceral taste for what before you would need a bunch of propositions. Yes. To know about, this isn't to know about, this is in some sense, um, in knowing those propositions and seeing with those propositions and then realizing what even gives those propositions that that back and forth relationship, right? That goes is both an identification and beyond itself and disidentification in realizing itself. That this back Excellent. and forth, this back and forth creates something like the ability to down at the level of, of fusis to taste, you could say, taste that idea as it emerges in the instant that it emerges. And it, rather than needing a proposition, let's say, right? You could just exactly intuit the highest level at the most primordial level of emergence. Exactly. It's like, it's like, so here's an analogy, uh, analogy. When you're drunk and you're sober and you know what the taste of that is pr yeah. procedurally, perspectively, even participatorily, your sense of agency, it's the sense of the intelligibility of the world, the agent and really in a relationship, right? And when you move from, when you, or when you wake up, this is why we have these metaphors of waking up or sobering up and notice it's up like in Plato's cave, right? It's, but it's like that. And you know, and if I were to ask you, yeah, but what's the difference? And you can give me something. And what you'll do is you'll start to talk about emergence from outside of you you'll start to talk about their continuity it's causal past you'll start talking about coherence then you start talking about how it all hangs together and that right and then you start talking right about a depth to it and you you basically redo the exercise but this is to explicate it and practice it and deepen it and extend it right so that 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 ability to wake up goes from being an idea that you think about to something that you can actually live and, and, and enact. And sense through and with and about, right? As one, yep. like one instant, right? You could say, yes. Yeah, yep. And both, I mean, both senses of the word sense. Yeah. Both senses, the perceptual and the cognitive sense of sense. Right. Like when you say, I'm making sense of something. Yes. It's, 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 it's that which is below the perceptual and the cognitive and what makes them bindable together you're getting down to that place or up to that place these metaphors all sort of fail us in one way or another yeah and so that's the point of this practice the point of this practice is to is to like in like hegel said you know you're only aware of a limit if you can go beyond it 
right? And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to practice not, not knowing. I know that I'm ignorant. I know that I'm, I'm bound. I know that my thinking is, you know, super. No, no. Stop talking about it and start realizing it and realizing it in a profound way so that, and, and I tell you, like, there's other practices I do, like the learned ignorance practice. And I'll talk to you about that at another time. But the, 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 way, the, the way these intrude <laughs> into my everyday patterns um, is what gives me uh, aspirational hope. Because I'll be doing this and I'll just get the taste. It's like, this is bullshit. What you're doing, John, is bullshit. You're just, you're just like, oh, look, it's all, it, it all, it's also, it's all very glowy and salient. And, and you're, you're just, oh, I love that. And look at how nice. And, and part of me just goes, no, that, that's bullshit. That's yeah. bullshit. Like, think about how, yeah. how much you, how much ignorance you're, you're ignoring. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, and, my and wife, so my wife does really well with me. Well, that's, I mean, that's what, that's what, a, that's what a partner should do. That's what a good friend should do. Yeah. Right. That, you know, uh, that's, a, that's the difference between a friend and a buddy, right? A friend, a, a, a buddy helps you fall asleep or, 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 you know, doze away from the world or right. But the friend uh, wakes you up uh, uh, hopefully um, yes. in, in ways that you can't do on your own. Right. Right. Totally. So this this, uh, this practice this practice the the touchstone taste mm -hmm. like it, it's it it feeds back so this practice keeps evolving for me like it keeps it it's it has a life of its own mm -hmm. and, and and this practice and the learned ignorance practice and the way the lexio divina has also evolved mm -hmm. like they're all doing this to each other in ways that um I can't for like I I couldn't have foreseen if I was just trying to, you know, step back and theorize about it or think about it, um, or try to derive it in some conceptual manner. It doesn't mean that it's all just romantic or anything like that. I'm not saying that. This this brings with it a kind of clarity uh, of of thinking that's analogous to the kind of clarity I get when I'm doing math. Um, um, that, because in, the, in, in, in math, you're playing with, and, you know, John Rusin talks about this. You're playing about these. You're playing about how everything, you know, there's these, there's these, right. There, there's these dimensions of, of, uh, of disclosure. That's what I want to say. Dimensions of disclosure. You know, there's the rhythms and the melodies and the harmonies that he talked. Math is about playing with um, a lot of the structures of intelligibility. Like, where are you doing them? Where, where are the mathematical objects? Well, they're not, they're in things, but they're not in things. And yeah. they form patterns. And, and then those patterns form patterns. And there's somehow some unifying thing behind it. But you can't actually unify it. You've got Godelian reasons. There's a lot of themes here that yeah. show up in math that, that are, are reflected. And so you can, you often get the same kind of clarity you get when you're getting that, when you're doing math and you're getting, when you're really realizing things, um, think about when, think about when, like when you, when you first got the Pythagorean theorem, not when you memorized it, but when you were doing it and when you knew, oh, this will always be the case, right? When you got, and notice there was emergence and then there was a through line, there's a continuity and you start doing the eidetic adduction. Oh, yes. this will, and then you suddenly do the noesis everywhere and nowhere. Yes. And then, right, right. right. And then, Right? Yes, totally. Yeah. It's not, I, I'm just also, as, as we're talking about this, as we were texting about this yesterday, about Garrett's understanding of what he was doing in his sciences, right? We could, yes. Like, yeah. plant, of seeing what gives that particular species of plant its speciesness, right? It, yes. It's beyond, it's within, but it's beyond the particular so how does it realize itself and then he realizes like oh this is it's realized in some sense my cognition right yes towards it and realized through it that allows you to see it deeper you can see this him literally trying to see or follow yeah. this intuition and that intelligibility right so, so I, I've only know a bit about Goethe. I was, I supervised a thesis, um, Matt, Matt Segal and I together. Um, no, Matt Segal and I were not supervising it. Sorry, we were external examiners of it. I apologize. Yeah. Um, but I was external manager. I think Matt was one of the supervisors. I can't remember the bureaucratic roles. Anyways, um, 
and uh, it was on, I forget the name of the author, and I apologize for that, um, but it was on Goethe's way of th- seeing and how he was trying to get the Ur form. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I'm considering very, very carefully the possibility, maybe in the plausibility that Goethe was doing something like, sorry, this does, I, this, I don't mean this to be sound self-aggrandizing, but Goethe was doing something like what I'm trying to do with eidetic adduction. Yeah. as a practice I, right I and like i said what i oh, parallel yeah. yeah yeah good i'm glad you see that then because that gives me some uh hope that i'm uh there is reasonable uh plausibility uh in the con- sense of the convergence yeah and like i said try, and ultimately what i want to do is weave better together the eidetic adduction practice with this view from above practice i think you need to get very good at the, the levels of being and the view from above right. practice um, but, but then also do the eidetic adduction at each level. Um, so there's, there's a lot more coming. Um, and you know, and it's, it's, um, so this is, I just got the sense of just even, even this very conversation is exemplifying the exercise that we're discussing. In, yes, very much. There's very a lot much. coming and it's still emerging. And I can tell even right now you're getting more about it and we're making more connection with Garrett. It's gathering itself, which shows it's beyond itself, right? The, the, exactly. The dimensions of this, because th- this practice, I mean, you started initially outside walking and there will be an imaginal component. And because you're walking and looking around, you will keep it imaginal and you won't make it imaginary. You won't take it inside to your subjective images. You'll yeah. make it the way in which you're interacting with the world imaginally. But then what you want to be able to do is do that all, all in a seated practice and nevertheless engage in it imaginally and not just imaginatively, not with just mental images. Yes. Um, and that, um, so I, I strongly recommend people to do the walking version of this practice um, for months before you try and do uh, the seated version. Now, of course, when we're doing the workshop, we sort of <laughs> hope yeah. that we can sort of get people into that a, a little bit uh, uh, yes. uh, faster. But part of what uh, Guy and I are hoping to do is to get a bunch of videos like this that can serve as background practice that, and we'll have a, hopefully a library of this that he makes and I make, we make together, Chris and I make, Chris and him make, et cetera. Uh, and, th- and so that we'll have a bank that people can consult and then they can build up um, a certain degree of experience and expertise, and then we would take them through the the whole dialectic into the logos yes. pedagogical program. Yes, I could see something where it's a, you just spend a month with each one of these levels, right? Very much, right? very much, and very like much. It could be just a, this could be a whole lifetime, actually. <laughs> very much so. It is, and you can see what what uh, what Aristotle meant about the life of contemplation. Yes. And, 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 the, and the point about it is, though, but remember, right, and this is the part that we, we do do in the dialectic and the dialogos. The point isn't just to go, go up, because reality doesn't just go up, it's to go down. Yep. To come, the, the philosopher comes out of the cave and then goes back down in precisely because only by going up and coming down does he or she complete the realization of being. If you think being is only that which is ultimately behind the appearance and not that which is also in the appearances, you haven't realized being, right? You have to do, and so you have to, you do this and then you bring it into, right? Like what we do in, in next in the practice, we do the circling practices in which we're intimate with other people. And then we do the dialectic practices and the contemplative practice. So it's not just floating away, right? You do the view from above so that you can return with fresh eyes yeah. to the seat of your companions. And what's great about these levels and tell me if this is, this sounds right, but this above and below and is going back and forth, right? In this way, the levels afford, it's you could say, it's like, as I get realized more intimacy on this level, which is at this level, right? The, yeah. right? That, 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 that intimacy is the process of realizing the above and the below, right? That affords, yes, right? exactly. That's and that goes back to your point, mm-hmm. right? 
you always, every level, and this is part of what you do, like this is part of the practice too, but this is a little bit more advanced. Every, like you're always, you're always recalling and being recalled, right? You're, as you're moving up, you're recalling, right? Everything that, like you said, you, you, so you see suke as the actualization of, of Fusus, but Fusus is the empowerment. But right. Suke is the right is the empowerment of Noesis, and Noesis is the act. And you're 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 seeing the deep up and down interpenetration, yeah. all of the emergence and the emanation, all the way through the practice. Yeah, and so then, that, and that's the, what I mean. The background, the background goes foreground. There's the. Yep. This is the. It's like it sounds like the different. Like how you know that you're kind of seeing the background going the foreground is that when the background goes to the foreground you recognize that the beautiful necessity of its previous concealment in order to be the background for this foreground, right? That's the, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what the, like when this is, is flowing, as I said, you, you like, and when you're moving towards the osis, the distinction between something being the most abstract and therefore the most profound and being the most intimate Yep. and therefore yep. profound is lost. It's simultaneously both of those at the same time. Yeah, you're pregnant with it's the other. most intimate experience and also the most abstract, but beyond both of those. Yeah, this is where that. Wh this is where you, I can just feel that, feel or taste that sense of what's going on in the word reveal. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's like so, you only veil things that are precious, right? So. So if you if the, if something is revealed, right? It's the process on one level. It's like unveiling it, but we say yeah. reveal, which is in some sense, in some sense, recognizing and realizing its preciousness in the unveiling of it, right? Is we it, we in some sense veil it with a certain kind of of realization of its preciousness, which is another veil. Right. Exactly. And, and that's why, and that, think about that, that the, the meditative questing part, it shouldn't be called meditative questing at this point, it's contemplative questing. Yeah. Right. But, but when, when, the, when, 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 when you get the answer, Oh, I've got it. Right. You don't treat it with hostility, but you treat it not, you neither deify it nor demonize it. Yeah. Right. You, thank you. Yes. But where yes. did you come from? Yes. From within yes. and from within and without. How did you emerge? Yeah. How did you take shape? How did you, all of it, right? Yeah. So that thank you, that recognizing yeah. that it's inherent. And if it's happening, there's a goodness to it, even if I don't see it or I didn't see it. And not seeing it is even good. Right? That the, but the, yeah, very much. Very much. The goodness. Uh, yeah, well, we should talk about this, you know, the the proposal about the inherent goodness of being but just a sense of, even at the propositional level we pursue truth because we sense there's a goodness in truth but there can be no goodness in truth if there's no goodness in being right and and and, and that goes towards really challenging the thing we've got from the enlightenment of the you know of the is ought distinction the value fact distinction but like even in the in, in academic philosophy these distinctions are breaking down under very powerful argumentation and reflection and they're they're putting us back into um, a sense of how it is really possible to fall in love with being because there's something good, true, good, and beautiful. The transcendentals that Aquinas talks about, the transcendentals of being, um, are real. Yes, right, right. This is great, John. This is really good. Well, let's let's talk again soon, and okay. let's uh, maybe do a couple more videos. Yeah, on this, uh, I'm trying try to untangle this. I'll put um, I'll put the uh, the levels uh, of that we just talked about below in the show notes, right? And then what yeah. and what we can both do um is is continue practicing this and write down little notes, right? And then we can get together, right? And and, and distinguish this more and more. And yes, more. always theory and theoria, though. Always yeah. how like always. Let's articulate it in theory, but only so that we can articulate it better in practice. Yes. And so it's such that the theory, you know, the theory is a good theory or the proposition is a good proposition. If it reveals more of what it, if it, it can display more than what it can say. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's yeah. even a new territory that then you can, that realization, that's like the birthing of intelligibility. 
Yes. Midwifing it. Yep. And the burning bush. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, my friend. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. Bye.